so the session for today is based on um, um, a data science guidance session Brittany and I had um, about two weeks ago. And the goal of this session is to visualize some RNA seq data from a public study. Um, and so you can find here the link uh, for that um, Google Doc, which I already have open here on the left. And so <clears throat> there's a couple of different R packages that we'll need to use today um, uh, uh, for visualizing the data. Uh, so that those are Shiny, ggplot2, and this other one called ggpubr, which you can install with these commands. Um, and then uh, we can also, we're also gonna, we're gonna see if we can try to use the IC package from Bioconductor with these data. Um, and so like, um, this is gonna be like a mix of like, you know, I mean, there's gonna be like a lot of live coding today because um, I'm gonna try to accomplish a couple of goals. Um, and so first of all, we're using data from a paper here that Brittany is interested in. Um, and the, let's open that paper um, first. Um, so this paper is uh, from Stefano Berto et al. Um, um, okay, we finally loaded. So um, I've seen Stefano quite frequently on Twitter. Um, he's a postdoc, if I remember correctly. Um, and he is quite active on the Twitter scene for R. Um, um, so it doesn't surprise me that he has made uh, his data easy to reuse, um, um, which is why we're, you know, we're gonna have this session today. So this particular paper here has data from um, humans, chimpanzees, and macaques uh, brains. So that's three different organisms, um, which makes it a little bit tricky. Um, and um, on the paper itself, at some point they mentioned the um, um, geo ID where they have uh, deposited the data publicly. Uh, um, and so Britain and I looked, I spent quite a bit of time looking at, at what they had um, shared on, on um, um, uh, through the GEO website. And like they have, they have a lot of the data there and we could use it. However, um, they also made this GitHub repository uh, over here, primate cell types. Um, where they have the code and they also say that they have um, um, the option of, I mean, the code for the shiny web applications for visualizing the data. And so this is what I ended up looking at. Um, and you can see it's mostly uh, being updated by Stefano Berto. Um, and looking at this, I found like, oh, they have this folder called shiny, which I recognize the name because that's an, an R package for um, in making these uh, web applications for visually um, for interactively exploring the data. And so inside of here, they have a couple of files and they made it really easy for us to use this. Um, and so they have four text files. Um, the data from this study is either from, from like new N or legal two, uh, um, I guess cells. Um, um, and um, these text files here, uh, two of them have this acronym adjusted expression, which um, are, I mean, ADG EXP uh, for adjusted expression, which are like the expression counts we wanna use. Um, they already adjusted for, like they already normalized the data at this point, which makes it easier to use compared to the data that they have on GEO, where we need to do more work to simply visualize the data. Um, they also have a couple here of uh, text files called uh, phenom, uh, for, which is short for phenotype. And if I look at the new N1, um, we can see here that they have four columns, the species, the sex, the age in human years, um, and the RNA integrity number, which is like enough to try to visualize the data. Um, and so this is already nice because we can see that they combine the HSAP, which stands for human sapiens, 
sorry, Homo sapiens, uh, which is the human. Um, uh, this one, which I think is, uh, uh, I think this is the chimpanzee and rest is macaque, which is a macaque, um, right? So then um, they already combined the data across the, the three different organisms. Um, and so this is like the first thing that we can try to use. They also include here a little R script for making their shiny website. So that's the first thing we wanna, um, like what I have listed today, the first thing that we wanna try to do is to simply use their code. Um, and so, um, so this involves downloading the data. And so let's like, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Um, um, so uh, if we go to the repository, we'll see this big green button set uh, you know, for code. And so there you can like, for example, download it as a zip file. Um, and there's other ways of downloading it through uh, GitHub, but like, if you, don't, if you don't have any of those things installed, you can simply download the zip file. So, um, 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 I'm going to download this on my computer um, over here. Um, uh, let me increase the font size here. Um, So there's a couple of different ways you could do it. I'm using git commands for downloading it. Uh, and I didn't mean to download it in the location where I'm at. Um, let's move it to my desktop. Um, yeah, um, So if I go to my desktop here, we have um, uh, the primate cell types files and inside of it, we have the shiny folder. Um, and then they have two scripts, app.r and to run. Um, so I'll open the to run one. Um, uh, let's see, uh, I, need to, I need to change my can you see those colors? That doesn't look like a color you can see. Let me change my um, uh, my R Studio colors. Um, right. so that probably you can see better. Um, <clears throat> so this to run um, R script here um, is going to load the shiny package, which I have already. Uh, but let's say you don't have these packages. And so at that point, we need to install Shiny, ggplot2, and ggpubr. So um, here I have the commands for doing that. So I'm going to simply copy them, paste them into my terminal. Um, and so this would install them. I already have them. So it's like I'm getting messages saying like, oh, it hasn't been changed. Do you still want to? Force installation, you could use force equals true if you wanted to have to reinstall it from scratch. But um, um, in my case, I don't need to, right? Um, so right now, if I use the get w command, that tells me where I'm located in my computer. So I'm not located in the same location as, the, as these scripts. So I need to go to the top of my window to session. Um, set working directory, and I want to choose a to source file location. Um, and so this RStudio will automatically change the location of my computer. So now I'm inside my desktop in the primate cell type um, folder um, inside Shiny. And so this point here, I'm going to be able to run this command, which is uh, uh, run app. Um, that they provide and it opens it, opens it in the browser. So here we have a little interactive website that opened up. Let me make my browser bigger. Um, and it doesn't seem very appealing so far, right? Like we don't have anything, right? Like there's no plots. If I click on box plot or violin plot, I don't see anything. 
But I see here that it has two different things. It says like choose expression table. So let me uh, click that. I'm going to go to my desktop um, to prime and cell types, shiny, and I'm going to choose a new one. So because it's expression table, I'm going to choose the adjusted expression file for new and primates. So I'll open that. Um, and then it says choose a subgroup stable, which um, I'm going to assume this is the phenotype table. So I'll open the new one, primates phenotype table. Um, and now, um, actually, the Shiny app updated, and now it's trying to give me an, uh, like an option here to based on what we know are the four columns on the phenotype table, which are species, sex, human age, and ring. Um, it also is telling me to choose a gene, right? And um, um, let me just try MOBP, for example. Let's see if that one works. Um, um, all right, so we have that gene symbol here and it's making um, a visualization here where we have on the y-axis, the log two CPM stands, stands for counts per million plus one. So it's the counts per million plus, um, uh, so it's, let's say it's the normalized expression plus one uh, in case it's zero. And then we take the log two just to make it um, easier to see across large differences. And we have here um, some box plots in the middle uh, with some outliers. Um, and then it's using something that's called a bioline plot, which uh, let me use an annotate utilities here and zoom. Um, so if you imagine that we have a line over here and then rotate the data 90 degrees that way, we'll end up with like a curve. Um, well, I mean, my drawing is not the best. Let me try to do it again. Um, something like that, which is the density plot. Um, it's just rotated. Um, and so this is helpful compared to a box plot because we can actually see that like, for example, in this particular region, we have a lot of data in this middle region. Um, um, but we can also see that, uh, uh, let me clear my colors here. Actually, let me use a different color. Um, like over here in the, in the gray one, we can see that there's a little bump of data um, after being after uh, like a decreasing data over here. Um, um, so violin plots combined with box plots are some ways people like to try to visualize uh, distributions. And so here we can see the distribution of expression for MOVP across the three different organisms. Um, 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 Let's change, for example, here the species. Let's, I'm going to select, for example, sex. And now I assume, yeah, it's showing me the changes in, this, in expression between sexes, male and female. Um, um, or I'm not sure if this one will work, human age. Um, I guess it categorized the, the um, human age into three different groups, one, two, three. I don't really know what they are, but we probably need to uh, read more in detail that paper. Um, the box plot over here um, is kind of like the same idea of visualizing the distribution of expression, but we actually see here every single sample as a, as a point. Let me go back to species. Um, um, and so here we can see um, uh, the actual data uh, that makes up the box plots or the violin plots. Um, so um, this might be good enough for what uh, Brittany uh, uh, or anyone using this data might need, right? Because maybe they want to simply explore their, their favorite uh, gene um, um, across the three different organisms, but this is using only the new end data, right? 
Um, and so let's let's um, let's try to build upon this. Um, it's going to close the Shiny app for now. Um, um, I'm going to close the Shiny app for now. And let's say that we actually wanted, to, let's say, to visualize the data for both the Oligo2 and new and data sets together. Um, so this is where, now that we have the data, we need to start like coding a bit more. Right? Um, <clears throat> and so uh, this is like uh, uh, something that we tend to work with quite, uh, quite frequently uh, with um, gene expression data using R. Uh, but it is something like if, if you just start with R, this would be kind of complicated. Um, um, so let me start here a, a new R script um, to show a little bit how we can try to combine the data for both. Um, so at this point, we're going beyond the uh, code that was given um, by Stefano Berto and, and collaborators. And now we're going to start like um, uh, playing around with the data ourselves. So we're going to use a package called summarize experiment, which is the bioconductor package. Um, and initially what I want to do is to simply um, uh, read in the data. So we have, we have two data sets, the new and, and the only two data sets. Um, um, and so here, maybe we could use tidyverse uh, code with Luis, uh, or uh, uh, I guess because right now it uh, seems kind of. Um, so let's see. Well, I'm going to use maybe an L apply here. Um, and so. Here, I'm going to look through the two data sets and I'm going to read in the counts uh, using uh, let's try to use read, read table. Um, uh, I'm going to borrow from the fact that they have. Um, um, uh, common file names, and then I'm also going to read the phenotype table. Miss an underscore over here. So we'll, re we'll read in both. Um, so to just, I'm going to just play around with, with one of them for now. Let's uh, play around with the new end, uh, because that way I can write my code to do a bit more things. So let's try reading counts and the phenotype tables. Um, so the counts here, like we have all the expression counts. Um, all Rodriguez uh, normalize. Um, um, at Fino, I'll be able to check the phenotype table. Um, and we have the IDs on the rows, uh, the four columns that we want here. So at this point, let's try to do a summarize experiment object. Um, um, We don't actually have information about where these genes are. We only have um, their symbol. Um, so I'll make a little table here. This is row names counts. That's only the only thing we have for the genes. And so summarize experiment object. Uh, we already we have a video about this type of. Um, um, objects in R um, from um, um, like a while back. But the idea here is that you have to specify 
assays. So we'll like say here list, uh, let's call it counts, even though this is really like already the adjusted expression, um, but we'll uh, just say these are the counts for the data. So those are the genes. Um, call data, that's our phenotype. So that will be our phen over here. Um, um, So let, let me save that here. And I'm going to read in the data for both um, for both data sets. <clears throat> so let's look at what we have now. So um, actually, let me give the names to it. Um, so here we have on the new end data, we have information for 8,300 8, genes across 53 samples. Um, for the illegal two, we have information for 75,000, sorry, not thousand, sorry, 7,500 genes across uh, 42 samples. Um, um, for both, we have the species, sex, human age, and ring. Um, so that is easy. That makes it easy for us to try to merge the data. The problem though, if we wanted to merge the data right now is that we don't actually have the same number of genes across the two tables. So that's where uh, it gets a bit more complicated because um, right now we just read in the data. So, um, Um, so we have read in the data, but like if I wanted to do, for example, um, um, if I wanted to combine them into one, it's like, oh, it won't let me because um, um, the data doesn't match the dimensions. So we can't run this right now. Sorry, can I ask a question? So is it not just the the sizes that don't matter, but the actual the specific genes, wouldn't they also not necessarily be the same? Yeah, so they might not be the same. Um, um, and so we need to make sure that they're all the same. And so here, the next step is we need to figure out the list of unique genes across both data sets. Um, so let's see. Um, um, what I'll do here is I'm going to look at each of my objects. Um, and what I'll do is I'll get the, I'll get, I'll get the genes that way. Um, And then I make sure that I get the unique genes. Um, so if I combine the genes across both, um, we have 9,000 genes across both of them um, that are unique. Um, and so here, if I want to combine things, um, I need to uh, do a little bit more work because uh, I'm gonna have to build like some empty large matrix matrices for each data set with this um, common unique genes, which in this case is 9,000 genes. Uh, and then I'll have to fill it in. Um, and then at that point, I'll be able to combine things. Um, so this is tricky to do. Um, um, and there's probably, nicer ways of doing this than what I'm going to try to do here. But um, <clears throat> um, let's call, let's make a, uh, uh, 
I'm going to loop through both of my um, elements here. And so just to um, work with one, uh, to try out my code, um, I'll work with the first one here. And let's build that empty large matrix. So um, um, so we'll build here, build here a new matrix. Uh, we'll fill it with zeros. Um, and so here, the number of rows that we want is going to be the number of unique genes. Um, the number of columns that we want is going to be the actual number of columns that we have in our current data set. So this way, uh, we end up here with a, with a large matrix that has 9,000 rows across the 53 samples. Um, so it's all zeros right now. And so we now need to fill it in with the data that we have. So um, we're going to here specify the row names here for our new matrix as the common set of genes that we have. But next we need to see like, what are the actual genes that we have in our current data? Um, and so, I'm going to make, I'm going to match them. So I'm going to look at the current genes that we have in our current data, and I'm going to match them to the genes here. Um, so um, in this particular case, we're starting with 8,372 genes, and we're going to, we're going to find exactly where they, where we have them in our new table. Um, now that I know where they are, uh, I can start to fill in the data. Uh, and so basically I can do on my new matrix on the, on the M rows, I can assign to it um, the counts of our RSC. Um, um, just to make it a, a little bit clearer here, I'm also going to do the call names when you matrix. I'm going to assign the current samples that we have. Um, mm, I don't know if I, that is not working. Let me know. Try this. All right. Um, so I'm assigning it to a matrix. I need to convert it to a matrix. Um, so let me run all of this again over here, all this code uh, that I'm writing. Um, and so let's look at, for example, our first uh, like 10 genes uh, for um, the first three samples. And I guess all of these ones here are already present. Let me look at the last ones. Um, so like 9,032, 9,037. Yeah, so these are all zeros, for example, because these are genes that were present only in the, in, in the second data set, but not the first one. Um, and so here now we have created um, our new matrix. Um, and so we can um, um, reuse some of the information that we had already. Um, um, so our accounts here is going to be our, our new matrix. We're going to uh, keep the same phenotype table that we had before. Um, 
However, the gene information now is going to be um, new. And so we'll see here um, that that is our new object here. So, um, um, so now we can uh, create these array summarized experiment objects um, uh, with our new matrices. Uh, matrices. So uh, I want to call it like uniform. Um, and it's still a list object at this point. So we look at it now. Uh, both of them have the same number of genes, 9,037. Um, they differ on the number of samples and like the actual data that they contain. Uh, but at this point, I, uh, we can now do, do call CBind. We can combine the two um, into single one. Um, cool. So now we have combine the data across the genes uh, based on their symbols uh, for the 9,000 unique genes across our uh, 95 samples. So why do we want to do this, right? Um, that's because at this point, now we can use other tools that exist out there uh, for visualizing um, gene expression data. And so one in particular is the IC package that we have also looked at at a previous session. And so um, I tr I'm trying to keep it like, um, like uh, friendly to new users, but you can see here that a lot of the code I had to use is not, like if you were a first time R user, you, this is true, too hard, I think. <laughs> right? There's a lot of like looping and things like that. Um, um, However, now that we have the object, right? Um, so, for example, if you know if anyone needed help with this part, we could we can help you create these type of objects. But once you once you have the object, um, uh, we can now use the IC um, function to visualize the data. So, um, is this? Um, this visualization is also using the shiny R package, um, um, which is the same one that uh, Stefano Berto and colleagues used. However, it's going to add like new things to to um, to our data. Um, and so it's trying to load at this point. Um, I guess it even as a warning is because it's trying to make plots for things that don't exist really um, in the object. Let me see if it actually, let's see if it actually ends up, ends up working. So, um, well, so it did load over here. Um, and so, <clears throat> Here we're looking at, for example, the expression of this first gene, AAAS. Um, uh, it's not that interesting, right? Because it's just like a bunch of um, uh, bodies. We don't know what the samples are, but we can click under visual uh, parameters. And let's use uh, species information. Um, and um, so that is adding like little colors for, for that. Um, or um, let's actually use a facet option here to facet by the species. Um, and so now we have our visualization of um, the expression for um, this particular gene across the three different organisms. Um, something that I meant, that I noticed right now is that we didn't actually keep track of which samples were um, oligo two and which ones were mu n. 
So I'm gonna have to close this. Um, and um, and add it actually um, to our object. So um, we'll call this um, data set. Um, um, Fine. So I've now added like, uh, if we look at the information in our object, um, um, I added here a column that like differentiates whether the sample is from a new one or an illegal two data set. Um, so I'll run this again, um, takes a little bit of time to load, um, but we'll be able to now actually use that information in our graphs. Um, Mm -hmm. There's probably ways we can make this a load faster because we don't actually use everything that um, IC is enabling us to do. Um, 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 because we're mostly interested in this interactive version or visualizing the, um, um, a particular gene, which they call here feature assay plot. Um, so let me go to visual parameters, select facet. Uh, we're going to facet by, in the rows, we're going to facet by, sorry, in the colors, we'll facet by the species. On the rows, I'll facet by the data set. Um, and I'll color by, um, I'll color by sex, actually. So now we're actually using a bunch of information that we have. Um, and so now we have like uh, red dots for females, blue dots for males. Um, and we can see this expression of this gene across uh, the new one and the legal two, uh, across the three different organisms that we have here. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe this is the plot that like, um, you know, Brittany wanted to see. Let's see if we can uh, uh, change the gene. So we'll use um, a dynamic selection here for um, um, that what I want. Um, sorry, I'll use. Uh, row data table one. Um, so I'm now linking these two elements of, of the plot uh, because now let's say if I click over here, uh, I clicked on a different gene, A and P. And so that is automatically uh, telling us to update the plot over here. And so by chance, A and P is a gene that was not observed in this illegal two data set. That's why if we have all these zeros, um, and it was only observed in the new one um, data set, right? So let, you know, I can search. Um, oh, I guess I need to type it in capital letters and it will be P. Um, so let's look at that gene, for example. Um, and now we get our little plot. And we can see that like uh, on the Oligo 2, um, the expression of MOBP is like way higher than on the new one, um, which is kind of expected because um, MOP, MOBP, is, MOBP is not as highly expressed in, in neuronal samples. Um, uh, um, so these are some of the things that we can do. Um, uh, now that we have combined the data together, uh, we could like also make other visualization plots, right? Um, like we could maybe use the GPUB R um, package that they use for making, um, that's a package that they made, that they use for making those like violin plots with box plots. Um, um, 
uh, that is like not natively supported here on this IC package, um, but um, IC is pretty powerful and you can do a lot of things uh, with it. And so I would say at this point, really what we need from IC is the box that says really the table one and the feature assay plot one. Um, um, now, you know, let's say exploring the data, you, you find a particular gene and you wanna make maybe a nicer plot than the one I see is making, at that point we can make it. Right? Um, but if you just wanna explore the data from, from this particular data set, I think this is uh, pretty powerful and, and good enough to, to, to get you going. And, um, and I don't know, let's say you actually wanna, uh, uh, we, can, we can try to add actually, um, uh, we're gonna use a shape here for column data, I'll use the shape for um, 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 I don't see rain. I don't know why I'm not seeing rain. Uh, oh, because probably it's numeric. Uh, mm, sorry, let's use the size then uh, for. Um, uh, use the size for rain. Um, I'm going to scroll up to see my plot now. Uh, rain shown as the size of the dot, smaller dots or smaller rings. Uh, it looks like most of it is pretty big rain. Uh, most of the samples here are pretty large rain. Um, uh, but you can see over here, you can see like different sizes of dots, right? We have a smaller dot, bigger dot. So I don't know, maybe green is not as informative. Um, um, maybe it is, right? Um, but that's how you can visualize using the size, you can visualize uh, continuous data. So maybe I'm gonna change it to the human age one. Um, and so maybe it's not as helpful because like, <laughs> the human age one are really tiny dots compared to the tree. Uh, but that's just like um, like something kind of quick, right? Uh, maybe you would actually uh, uh, want to use it as the color. So let's use here, for example, color by, um, let's color by uh, human age and then use the shape by six. That might make more sense for our plot. Um, so uh, dots are females, triangles are males. Human age is shown in this uh, continuous scale. Um, um, and if you actually wanted to see it as categorical, we could like modify our object, um, make the data, make the human age categorical. Because uh, if we only have values one, two, and three, Maybe it doesn't make sense to view it as a continuous variable here. Um, but you can kind of already see uh, um, um, the relationship between human age and, um, and all the data that we have here. Right? So um, yeah, that's it. Let me stop recording. <laughs>